I'd like to talk about this, and that's definitely what changed during last times, during my experiences, is uh, about uh, lean ways of indicate that you're on the right way. So I changed from validate to validity, validity, validity uh, indication, uh, because it's in a lean way not to be understood. It's always showing that you may be on the right track, but it's not a proof that you are totally right. So that's why I changed it to just prevent uh, misunderstandings. So I would like to talk about quick ways, how you can see if you are still on track with your product or with the idea of a solution, or if you understood the customer right, or if you maybe already lost it. So, but it's still not a proof that you will be totally successful in the end, only just because you're doing some of them. Um, yeah, short, uh, my background. So I'm with Zalando for four and a half, five and a half years now. I was in a fashion store for two years, uh, responsible for search and sorting there. Then I had a bigger research project with IDEO for four months, where I really learned a lot about design thinking from those guys uh, directly. Uh, which changed a lot of my way how I work as product, definitely. So, and then I started a totally new venture within Zalando um, in, in mobile on iOS and, and Android. And now since a few weeks I have a new project um, switched there. And yeah, that's something that will be launched soon. So it's a big question mark until now. <laughs> I will be web-based definitely, so I'm switching from app with all I learned there back to web now to see what uh, I can do there. So that's just an example from the uh, app within one year. We iterated a lot, we learned a lot, we changed a lot. It was just a quick impression from the design that you see there's a lot of stuff happening all the time and we're constantly trying to improve stuff or see that there are new problems occurring and trying to fix them. So, uh, yeah, users have 99 problems. Um, but I understand one, so it's always good to really understand the problem, to dive deep, to not only having some indication, but really learning what's the problem of the user so you can think about the solution. Um, yeah, we all know, I guess, uh, the situation that asking for requirements doesn't really help you here because people just telling their wants, their wishes, their predictions of the futures. It's maybe not what they really need. So. Okay, we're trying to understand the problem. That's something, I guess, that in the at least agile product development world, everyone agreed on. So that you can uh, go further with. So as an example, for our research with IDEO, out of 30 people we had there as customers uh, in three different countries, 20 said they don't go shopping alone, but they do with partners, friends, or family. And five read blogs before they go shopping alone. So, and three said, oh, yeah, I don't need anything, I'm just shopping alone, that's cool. But though, from the uh, quantity you see there, you think, okay, most people more or less want to shop with someone else, so online shopping lacks some kind of social factor. So and then we said, okay, wait, that's maybe way too easy to see it like this, right? It's a really quick impression, it's not really an insight. So we step back, we shuffled everything around, we look from different angles, and um, then we found something that we think there's really a common problem of all, and it's all, uh, they look for confirmation. So, and that's what they all have in common, even the ones that want to go alone, because 20 just doesn't trust, trust the shop assistant, so they want a trusted person with them that give them feedback that is real. And five, even don't trust the fashion opinions of their friends, because they said, hey, I'm way ahead, those guys wearing the stuff that I'm not wearing for years. <laughs> And uh, three were just fashion professionals, so they have different sources to validate their fashion opinion way before blogs can do it themselves. But they all have some sources to get a confirmation of their fashion taste. So, okay, that's now an insight you can work on, on online. Also, creating social moments in online fashion e-commerce is maybe a problem you will not really serve and suck anyways. That's a problem you can really work on and give confirmation to everyone when they want to buy something. So uh, what I do now, or want to do today, is just giving you lots of examples, all uh, coming out of the practice, so I did all of them myself. Um, you will hear from a lot of them, I guess, but it's really about really living them and doing them, so I'm giving you just some practical stories to the stuff. So one of them, which I learned at IDEO, which it's not so popular from, from what I've heard, uh, because a lot of people don't know it, it's analogous research. Analogous research means that you're just taking your problem and looking to a different business that's some kind of similar if they have the same problem and how they solve the problem there 
of what users on their business doing as a workaround, whatever, to then check if you can use this knowledge for your own business and your own problem. So, for instance, <coughs> we went uh, to Nos in Paris. That's a cent shop. They have more than 500 different cents. You can imagine, want to buy something there, you won't smell anything after the tents. So they need to find something uh, how they solve that. And they have a really perfect way how they do that. They give you five basic cents that are really different and they all are the top cent of a family. So you decide between those five. You're saying this is the best one, this is the, what I really don't like. And based on the two top ones, they're giving you another set based on your selection. And you can go deeper into that. So it's going finer every more until you find a scent that you say, OK, that's what I really like. You can take your time. You're getting those uh, samples. You have an iPad. You can really smell. You can think about it. If you're ready, you just select on the iPad what you like. And then they're coming back and giving you something new. So that was a really interesting uh, research experience to see how other uh, businesses with overwhelming uh, product range can solve that, right? Because you can imagine that Lano has about 130 articles live. It's sometimes hard to explain to a customer why he should buy this black shirt, but not this black shirt. <laughs> so that's the way how you then really can funnel this down and everyone could understand this. Uh, another uh, way we're using analogous research is <laughs> Um, yeah, as I was working for search in a fashion store for a very long time, I know a lot, but I didn't knew uh, specific knowledge about really mobile search. So we said, okay, we do a um, um, dedicated project only for mobile research, for mobile searching. How would people really search on small screens? Um, and for this, we thought about every case you could do in kind of search and uh, finding articles, and then. Uh, uh, transforming them to jobs to be done. So uh, I hope everyone had heard of the idea of jobs to be done. Good. So that's an example. So when I uh, see nice pants uh, worn on the streets, I want to find out uh, where to get pants like this, so that it can just be as cool as a dude on the street. So that's uh, one job you can then work on this. And for analogous research, we used all those jobs we created and translated them. Yeah. To, oops, to a different business. So let's say analogous research lifestyle, not only fashion, we, we take music. So when I heard the cool music at yesterday's house party, I wanted to find out where to get this music so I can enjoy and have fun listening to it during work. So it's kind of translation of the same job. You can use it then for a business music area. Uh, and then we took loads of apps and tested them with all the jobs to see how we can get those jobs done in those apps to see what kind of mobile search experience they deliver. Um, we did this with loads of apps, with every app that we get the info that it's an awesome search experience in their field and so on to test it really. And then we took the best apps out of that for uh, further user research because we said, okay, we did it on our own. We did it on our own because we cannot use users to test 50, 60 apps. So we do a pre-selection and then seeing if users react on the same apps in the same way we did, or if they maybe think something totally different about it. So we let the users do the jobs and totally do the talking to just see how they think then about the search experience there. And yeah, uh, big surprise there was the moment when really everyone uh, out of the users said with one app, okay, I really can't solve the jobs here. Can I just quit the app and do it in another way? And I said, okay, that's totally fine. Just quit the app. Show us what you would do to solve this job. So we're learning from their workarounds and what they ever do there. Um, that was totally fine and interesting. So, and yeah, now one example there is maybe also like Pinterest. We learned that if you are really in an inspiration trip, you want to see pictures, similar pictures, uh, um, seeing stuff there, uh, exploring stuff. It's a really nice search experience. If you want to see, okay, I have this green Stan Smith and I want to see what kind of trousers fitting to that, the search experience on Pinterest really sucks. So it's really hard to find this specific kind of content. It's really brilliant if you're going more inspirational, open way to get new stuff there. Um, so uh, we took this to then really define what could we use for our fashion search for e-commerce uh, out of those apps? What is a good way uh, on what do people really, how do they really search? So like for mobile, one of the assumptions was 
people using text a lot because it's a small screen, it's a pain. They don't, at least not for fashion. They are really more for visual comparison of products. And even one girl, she really uh, used a lot of the text things for every job. At a certain point, she said, okay, from now on, I will switch to more filtering or uh, down the stuff because if I now change my query, I'm afraid that I'm losing the articles. And I have the feeling I'm nearly there and now I'm switching to visual comparison because otherwise I'm just afraid I'm losing the stuff. So that was really interesting for us. So uh, another thing uh, besides the analogous research is experiments in online, offline uh, things or in the app. Um, there's a lot of stuff you could do um, if you split up your assumptions or your big problems into really small single tasks that you can easily think of what's an experiment to answer this small part of your big question or big problem and you can really test it independently from all the others so you get a clear indication for this small part not like if it doesn't work didn't it work because of this thing of this setting of that problem so the more you isolate the things the better it is for you to get an experiment running that indicates if you're solving this small question then you're going to the next question and so on. So uh, to start with, you need to think of, okay, what's the most important question you need to answer to go on? So what's the stopper? If you don't find an answer, an indicator for this thing, you don't need to work on this problem anymore because then you just don't got the basic core of it or you didn't solve the biggest problem to go on with your solution. Um, for experiments, it's quite easy in a way to design them to think of like storyboards. So you're thinking, what do you want to set up? Do you want to set up offline experiment? Do you want to set up online questionnaire, fake buttons, whatever? Then you're drawing out the whole thing, kind of um, opportunities they have within that. And it's easy to uh, then discuss if the experiment is set up in a good way or if you even indicated, okay, we need somehow to improve it to get it really working to get an answer without bias from users. And what helped me there is always having a one sheet with the biggest question, what is your KPI before you start? So you cannot cheat on yourself. You're always having something you say, we're measuring on this, not later, ah, oh, I like it so much, that, the, that indicator is not that good, but the other one was cool. So it's really be true to yourself before you start because then you cannot cheat and it really helps you because otherwise it will always be some cheating all the way and it's never working out because you didn't solve the first one. So, um, yeah, stuff you all know. I guess that it's really proven concept is guerrilla testing. So it's quite cheap, it's fast, and it's really quick to iterate and test something else again after you went, got your first feedback. And you can do it in every stage of building. So you can use scribbles, paper prototypes that you also can build, wireframes, full designs. You can apply it on every stage, just going out, asking somewhere, as somewhere or some people that fit into your target group. So you just need to think of, okay, what's a good location to meet the people that you need for your app or for your, for your product? Or what's the uh, maybe age group, whatever, that you need to talk to? So it doesn't make sense to talk uh, to all people if you want to have something for teenagers, right? Because they really act different. But as soon as you know uh, where you can find those people, you can just go out and meet them. Special event, on the streets, school, whatever is your target group. So, and what uh, really helps here is go in teams, not alone. Because it's much more easier first to just ask people, and it's not so scary sometimes if there are two people just, instead of one and one can speak, easily having some casual talking, the other one just takes note, not interrupting this. Uh, it really works in a good way. Um, then you should prepare questions to get people already in the mood. So you think about, okay, if I'm asking people uh, some problem on their product GitHub page, then I need a story to tell them that they get in the mind, okay, from there and there, I'm opening this new app, I'm going to the product detail page from there, and now I'm here and having this situation. So not only showing the, the page, but having some kind of info story that you already are uh, in a mindset and you can just ask them as if they had the situation in real life. And for every action, you should ask them to tell you the expectations before they really do something. Like if you have a clickable prototype, 
ask them, okay, before you press the button, just tell me what you think, what happens if you do it. After they uh, uh, tapped it, for instance, you can ask them, okay, did you see some difference here? What did you see instead of your expectation? Do you think it better, worse, that it helped more, or what's your uh, impression now? That's the situation where you can really learn a lot, asking them before what they think what's happening, and after that seeing, okay. Yeah, and sometimes you can also uh, uncover bigger issues. So that's for an example, we're working uh, with a really interesting um, company that's having some kind of a virtual uh, fitting. So you're taking a photo of you, then you're getting the dresses from the uh, shop in the app and can just put them on your own body to see if the style fits to you and see yourself in those clothes. Uh, therefore, you need to do a photo of yourself that you have the mapping of your body. And then we learned already that there are some issues with the way it was at this moment because then yeah, people say in the testing, yeah, you know, doing photos in underwear of myself, it's a bit strange because then I don't know what's happening with this and then I need to ask someone to take a photo and I'm standing in front of them with underwear, a bit scary sometimes. <laughs> so uh, we decided that we need some kind of opportunity to upload the photo from your photo library from that, that you can use something that you did whatever and then just uploading it and selecting it instead of doing a live photo. So, um, of course, if you have this issue in the beginning and implementing everything, then no one will use it and you will wonder why. And it's really simple uh, a thought as soon as you dedicate it and say, yeah, sending an underwear in front of someone else, asking for a photo is maybe a bit scary. <laughs> So another thing that we use, what is also quite helpful, is uh, fake buttons. So uh, you see in the screenshot, not really, but we added uh, some kind of photo camera button on the right hand side. We wanted to learn if people wanted to upload a photo of their style themselves. So, And uh, the way to do this is really um, to pretend that you already have a product that's offering this service and then see if people are just acting on it. So um, there are some examples that are, I think it's really old now because everyone is fighting against it with these fake landing pages. They just pretend to offering a service and people can subscribe to it by giving their email. And then yet Thomas Sharon just said, yeah, we will just learn uh, that those people will give you your email address, not if they want to use your service. So you should really pretend to have the product already and then see if they act. If no one acts, you know, okay, it's maybe not interest interesting if they act on it. You can later ask them what they're expecting, what they want to do, but you need to trigger this action. So, uh, yeah, fake doors, we did this uh, for the uh, user styles. We had the fake button, you see, just there. And from there, we went then to design it because we got a lot of uh, uh, reactions there. So not everyone wants to do it, but enough people. Uh, and then we introduced a possibility for people in our app to do shots of themselves and also linking the products they are wearing uh, to the styles. And uh, yeah, more or less for this, it was really interesting to see that the percentage we had in the um, experiment before, more, more or less also the same percentage that we really did it later. So also constantly. That was a, a really interesting uh, insight. Another thing where we had this more or less faking the product in a different way is really offering the most basic feature you could do and then adding just a questionnaire later. So we had a video running just with the play button and then we're just asking them people if they like this kind of content in the app, if they think it doesn't add too much on mobile, you have this bandwidth problem, it's maybe taking too much time because you're just scrolling through. So we had this kind of video and whenever you've seen the video, we added the questionnaire later for everyone that's seen it, if they want to see more, if they think it was boring, whatever. Tonality is adapted to uh, really young people to age 22. So we also tried to get their uh, tonality there, not being too formal. Um, and it also worked out quite good for, for getting really feedback from people. So another thing you could do, we also did uh, was really user service, so picking existing users and sending them in, uh, a survey, asking them uh, several questions. Um, how sad they would be if your service wouldn't be available anymore. So um, then based on that, what would be their alternative? What would they use if you are not existing? Um, 
what would they, or what did they like most? What did they help them most? Because sometimes it's different that you have some feature that you really love, but something else really helped you to do something. And what do they would like to see improve? So that's uh, uh, some kind of uh, predicting question, but it's always interesting to see what kind of feature they maybe might be uh, uh, see there, uh, but uh, have the feeling that it's not enough. Um, you can just use this information later to see if you want to improve in that and, and experiment further. And if they would recommend it, how they would describe your service. So that's really to learn about your USPs in the term that people telling other people what's the cool thing on your, on your app, you're learning about your USPs from your users. It's not like you made it up before and said, hey, we have this super cool industry feature that no one else has because they maybe have something totally different and you need to change the storytelling for your app uh, to, to get it interesting for everyone. And if they already maybe recommend the service to others. So, uh, yeah, you can learn if it creates value for users, what's the USB of your app, like I said, and what your customers really love, but also what your customers really helped, uh, uh, and what are your competitors. So, you maybe have the feeling these and these guys are your competitors in the market, but maybe for your target group, because you are not in there. They have someone that is totally different. You thought it's not that important, it's not such a big player, but maybe it's really popular uh, in the target group. So it's in interesting to get this information to really grow further and concentrate then on things you can uh, work with in a positive way or also need to see what you need to fix. Uh, if everyone mentioning that, hey, come on, your order process really sucks. So <laughs> I did it because I love the shoes, but you could improve there, everyone else did it better. So you can really think of stuff like this then. Um, one general uh, experience there is always design and test in teams. So depending on the setup, there's sometimes only one product manager in the team, one UX guy, but you also have um, engineers. And the more different perspectives you get into the design and test phases, the better it is uh, really to discover opportunities to get different thoughts on it and different feedback before you go out to users. Um, and it's also, uh, for a later perspective, always good to get everyone involved in the early phase because everyone then owns the topic, the product, and uh, the commitment is much, much better from my experience. If everyone is also in this creation designing phase, knows where the solution is coming from, not only sitting there, oh, there was a guy, he made this up, and now he decides that we need to build it. Um, it really, really helps, and you get a lot of uh, also uh, helpful feedback from engineers, and from my experience, they maybe don't have time, all the time you want to have them, but normally they are open and interested in learning and seeing stuff. Especially if they build something for users, they would love to see the users using it, and seeing what kind of feedback they're getting there. Um, yeah, one thing where you can really good collaborate on with everyone, I guess, already heard of now is design sprints. So you're having one uh, more or less problem you're thinking about uh, and getting one solution, at least with one validation until the end of one week. So we have you also did it. First day having onboarding, ideation things, prototyping, getting ready for testing. On Wednesday we went out we improved the prototype and went out again on Thursday already and then having a final design on Friday. Um, we did not code in this week, but uh, we had two UX, two PMs and two engineers in the, in the project and it really helped to get every one of them off. So biggest thing there is because yeah, we work remote with Finnish uh, uh, engineers, we were in Helsinki for this design sprint also to involve them more. Um, and everyone really was afraid of if we can find Finnish people out in the streets that would talk to us. So, uh, yeah, in general, you, there has Finnish people are talking a lot, so it's a stereotype, but on the other hand, somehow it's true that they don't talk that much, and they somehow also feel comfortable just to not talk. So, and <laughs> there's this joke uh, I heard, and somehow it's uh, uh, true that you have, so what's an introverted Finn? Finn? So, you can just detect him because he's looking at his shoes. So, and how do you recognize an extroverted Finn? He's looking at your shoes when he's talking. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> and this somehow gives the impression that also all the Finnish uh, uh, colleagues said, so uh, I'm not sure if we find someone that wants to talk on the streets with us, or everyone just say, oh, go away, I don't want to talk to strangers. And yeah, finally, it worked also the same as in Berlin. So we find enough people to talk to. They were really open. If they, you let them talk, they were happy to talk about their point of views. They want really to help you. Uh, and took then also the time you ask for five minutes, you get 15. So that's then really easy. If you get them to talking and just let them talk, you also get 15 minutes from them really, really easy and quickly. So uh, yeah, big surprise, especially for uh, the Finnish people itself, was that it's not such a problem to do uh, guerrilla testing, uh, testing outside. So um, that's another thing, um, because yeah, talking a lot of testing, small things, this and this and that. Testing everything might slow you down, so there's not a need to test every small thing that you maybe can do or could test, but testing the right things and focusing on, on what you really want to achieve will speed you up, because you're getting validity on the most important problems and the biggest problems that you have, and you're getting uh, quick feedback if you are on the right way for a solution. So you don't need to test the details of every solution, but you need to test the first approach and the biggest uh, uh, step for the solution itself, so that you can just go on with that. Um, yeah, another thing is, if you are there after your research, after exp experiment, write design principles before you're really designing a solution. That really helps, uh, like defining KPIs before a test, defining your principles, how you want to design stuff, based on your insights, based on your research. And make your learnings actionable. So as an example, out of this mobile search experience, one of the insights was fashion customers have a fuzzy idea of what they're looking for and they cut down uh, results by comparison on site. So we offer users strong visual access and guidance for everything we are uh, doing on our site. So you're having an insight, what their people acting on and how they are working with the problem. And then you can say, okay, design principle will be for every solution we have, we have to have a strong visual access to it. It's not text-based, it needs to be on mobile, visual and quickly recognizable by people. Every action needs feedback and so on. So it's really uh, a good thing to pre prepare before you start designing. One book you know after yesterday, definitely. Um, the other one uh, I read, I found really, really helpful is uh, Lean Customer Development. First one is yeah, really more about the whole customer development, also communicating within your company and getting the values of this to everyone. And then also doing the whole stuff with your customers. Thomas Sharon's one is a bit more into depth for the experiments themselves, but both were really, really good and helpful. So if you are into the topic of quick validations, then I can just recommend to read both. They really help. And if you did this, then hopefully you only have 98 problems to go because you understood one. And last but not least, that's my advice uh, from my own experience. If you feel inspired by this and you like the, the idea uh, of getting lean experiments, you really need to start living it. So no one else would do it for you. In no company, you just need to start living it and then you can convince people that it's a good way to do and you can get them more on board. Then. That's my experience for this. And as far as now, it just works out quite well also to convincing people. So, that's it. Thank you.